So seven years into my illness, I learned that a surgery might help me. And since I'd spent the last seven years homebound and bedbound, this was amazing news. But there was a problem. No good surgery existed. And the surgery that did exist would give me a new disease. Now doctors take an oath to do no harm. So the idea of giving a patient a new disease in the hopes that it's better than the one they have isn't very appealing. And I didn't want a new disease either. I was dealing with enough. So I was in a difficult spot. I was in a trap. Calling the doctors wouldn't get me the surgery, but not calling the doctors wouldn't get me the surgery either. So what was left? Well, I decided if I needed a surgery and there wasn't one, then I'd invent one. Now, I wasn't a surgeon and I wasn't a doctor. I was a homebound college dropout. So how does a patient get to the point where they truly believe their best path forward is to invent their own surgery? Well, for me to talk about that, we'll have to go back about seven years. In 1999, when I 21, I got sick. I had just started a summer biochemistry research position at the University of Kansas when I came down with what the doctors told me was mono. But after months of rest, instead of getting better, I got worse. Yeah, I was a grown man, so I was a grown man laying on the floor of my home and I couldn't function. My heart was racing, the room was spinning, and I had painful cramping muscles. I could get a heart rate of 140 for several hours, even while laying flat, just from eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Sometimes you could put a piece of loose leaf paper on my chest and watch it flutter, my heart was beating that hard. So it was terrifying. And I saw a series of doctors, a series of specialists, and they couldn't tell me what was wrong or what would help me. So I was in a terrible spot, and I realized no one was coming to rescue me. And that was quite a problem. So what I decided to do was take the lead in my own condition. I would work with doctors, but if we couldn't, if we struggled to find answers, I would take the lead. You, you find that after going to doctor after doctor and coming up empty, maybe the way doctors operate wasn't going to be enough to find the answers. So that's what I did. I changed the script. I took the lead and I tackled my problem like a scientist. So I started reading. At the time, that's all that's the best you can do. I bought 1,000 and 2,000 page medical texts and I read them. And I figured I was looking for something. I figured if it was common, the doctors would have found it. So I was looking for something rare. And about a year into my illness, I came up with an idea. I theorized that there was likely an entire class of disorders that involved dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. Now the autonomic nervous system controls heart rate, blood pressure, metabolism, and digestion. And I contended if this system was malfunctioning, you would see problems with heart rate, blood pressure, metabolism, digestion problems like we were seeing in me. So I wrote up what I had and I pulled it together and I went to the doctors, you know, complete with bibliography. And they said, problems like you described don't exist. And I said, but they could. See, doctors practice from experience. So the idea that a patient is coming rolling into their office and theorize the class of disorders that they don't routinely encounter and that they don't know anyone who specializes in treating, that sounds absurd. But I was approaching this like a scientist. So the idea that there was a complex system in the body, but nothing could go wrong with it, to me, that sounded absurd. So that was the stalemate, and that's where things sat for another nine months, until I finally got a computer with internet access. And within a month, I had found a nonprofit devoted to the kinds of problems I theorized existed and were told did not. That happened through the, the NORD website. So this is the National Organization of Rare Disorders rare diseases there. One is on the website, one is in the name. And so I found this organization and it turned out that autonomic nervous system problems are called dysautonomias. This is dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. And then I turned to Medline. So this is through the National Library of Medicine. And they had created this online journal database for all of these articles. Not all articles on autonomic dysfunction, articles on bioscience, medicine, all of it. 
So I could now paw through this thing and search and ask queries and find references, send them to friends who'd gone on to med school and say, send me the articles. And if they couldn't do it, I would write the authors and they would send them to me. So I started reading and reading. And within 18 months, I'd come up with an idea for a proposed treatment. I'd been invited to present a paper at an international medical conference, and I was gonna go. <laughs> so these other people in the photo, they're not strangers. These are the kind, I, I require help to travel. I'm in a reclining wheelchair. I have people pushing me, people holding doors. I had to buy multiple airline seats so I could lay across them because I couldn't sit for very long. If I stood, I could walk about 50 feet, and I could stand for about the length of a commercial break. And if I started to exceed these limits or even ate the wrong kind of meal, that's when I would get the racing heartbeat. That's when I would get the pounding fall. But I mean, that's just a few minutes of standing. So that's what I used to have to do. I would lay across the airline seats and that's how we travel. So when I went to this conference, I was going as a scientist, not a patient, but it was hard to keep them separate. I'd spent two years contending these problems existed and I was finally gonna be in a room full of people who knew I was right. And so the first time I met an autonomic investigator, I cried. Like I didn't want to, but it was lunch. And it was, it was a big moment because again, my mother, my aunt, these were people in my family who were also sick for decades with no answers. And now there were people from Vanderbilt, from Harvard, from the Cleveland Clinic, from overseas, who, who knew I was right, that these things at least existed. So when I presented, here I am, you know, outlining the proposed treatment for my own disorder. The poster before mine is from the Mayo Clinic, and the poster after mine is from a university hospital in Japan. And in the middle is me, a 24-year-old college dropout in a reclining wheelchair. So the presentation went well, but I hadn't gone there just to talk. I'd gone there to find a collaborator, somebody to work with. And that didn't happen right away. I came home at the end. It took me another 18 months. But I finally started working with Dr. H. Cecil Cosby. Dr. Coghlan was the director of the Autonomic Nervous System Laboratory at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And so he was an expert in the field, he was a pioneer. And if you look, he's excited to work with me. So after five years, homebound, bedbound, sick, I finally had someone who believed in me and believed in what we were trying to do. So I went to Birmingham and I, we tried my proposed treatment and it halted my decline. And we also did a lot of careful testing. And they showed, yes, I did have a very severe autonomic nervous system problem. But it took us another two years to figure out exactly what was going on. And the best we could tell, I had either primary hyperepinephrinemia or adrenal medullary hyperplasia. So these are long names, and on a phone call, it gets a little exhausting to keep trying these out, even if we're participatory. So we decided to call it Lindsay syndrome, because that's my last name. <laughs> we didn't know exactly what it was, but we had a good we had a good feel. And it turns out, either way, whether it was this thing at the top or that thing at the bottom, it was rare. The best I could find were 32 cases worldwide documented of this condition. We've had 45 presidents. So when you start to do the numbers, you realize you are more likely to be diagnosed, you're, excuse me, you're more likely to be elected president than to be diagnosed with either one of these problems. So that was a pro that was a difficult circumstance because there was a very small well of expertise to deal with this. But there was also good news. Either way, it meant that the middle of my adrenal gland was hyperactive and secreting too much adrenaline. And either way, if we could remove that hyperactive tissue, my life should get better. That's when we ran into the problem. There was no surgery to do that. And that's where I came up with the idea of maybe I should invent one. So this is an adrenal gland. The outside, the pink part, in the, in the cartoon, in real life they're all mushy and brown. And so the outside is the cortex. That makes steroid hormones that you need to live. The inside is the medulla. That makes adrenaline. That's the part we wanted to remove. But it was the good tissue was being held hostage by the tissue we wanted to take out. So if we could take out the middle and leave the outside, my life should get better. So the problem is, one of the top surgeons in the field described trying to do this as trying to cut the peanut butter out of the peanut butter sandwich and leave the bread. 
So the next problem is the adrenal gland is not as big as a sandwich. That's my thumb, that's a nickel, and that is 11 slices of human adrenal gland. So we are trying to take out the middle of those pieces and leave the outside. So I needed a surgery that didn't exist, and it didn't exist because everyone thought it was impossible. But impossible or not, it still was my best path to help. And remember, I, I described this as soft impossible. It wasn't like, I'm gonna go back to the prom and do it right. I mean, it was just, <laughs> this is something that didn't exist. You know, like, why don't you take, why don't you take your phone out and take a video and go home and do that. So to me, this was something that should be achievable. So I started looking. I didn't know how to invent a surgery, but I knew how to research. And so I started there. I tried everything. It took me two and a half years to prove that the surgery wasn't impossible. And I worked with everyone, from the chairman of the President's Council on Biomedical Ethics to the Japanese ambassador's son, who I sent to Tokyo with my medical records to meet with experts there, because I needed someone who spoke medical Japanese. <coughs> and I started for a year, oh goodness, I, I, I might go six minutes. So, so I'm digging, and it turns out that a year into this, I find that the surgery I needed was possible in rats. So it had been done in Georgia State by a biology professor. And he sliced into the rat adrenal gland and squeezed until the middle popped out like a pimple. Well, when I brought that to the head of endocrine surgery at University of Chicago and his colleagues, they were not overly impressed. <laughs> <laughs> so I kept digging. And it turned out the surgery had been done here in Boston at Harvard in 1926 on cats. And Walter Bradford Cannon, a pioneer who has a mountain named after him, spent half a sentence explaining the surgery that might save my life, and spent half a page on how he accidentally invented the beer bomb. <laughs> <laughs> so he may have saved spring break, but he didn't hold the clue to saving my life. So I had to keep digging. I worked with the medical historians and his biography and the history of science department here at Harvard. And eventually I found that the surgery I needed had been done in dogs in 1940 in Oregon. And they didn't explain it either. So we were in this absurd position where biology professors 80 years ago thought so little of this surgery that they didn't explain how they did it in their papers. And the world's best human surgeons couldn't figure out how to do it. So I kept digging and I finally found the answers from an article from 1923 from Argentina. That's the year before the Great Gatsby was published. And Bernardo Husse, who went on to win the Nobel Prize and who Dr. Coghlan knew personally, explained the surgery like this. He said, he sliced into the adrenal gland with a sharp Gillette blade and opened it like a book. Then he scraped out the middle with a small hard spoon. Then he sewed it back up. That was the surgery. The surgeons were stunned. I can understand how they didn't think of a spoon, you know, when we were talking about how to do this. But even when we figured out how to do it, it's not like the gates just swung open. It took another 18 months before I found someone to do the surgery. And it was at the University of Alabama, Birmingham again. And they decided to use the surgical, the Da Vinci surgical robot instead of spoon. But after 11 years, I got a chance to bet my life on the operating table for the surgery that had taken four years to develop. After it happened, we still didn't know if it worked because we didn't know if it was going to make me better. And so for three weeks, we really didn't know. But then things started to change. Pretty soon I could sit for, th I, I went to a neighbor's house and I sat for three hours instead of just a few minutes. And I could start walking further. When I got the surgery in September, I could walk about 50 feet. But I started walking further every day and doing anything I could. By Christmas, I could walk a couple of miles. So on Christmas Eve 2010, after 11 years homebound, I walked out of my house in the snow and I walked to midnight mass into a church that was about a half mile away. I've been there dozens of times. And I stood in the back for the entirety of the service, and tears were just streaming down my face. Now, one of my neighbors said that a miracle is only a miracle if you can't explain it. So, I took a long forgotten 90 year old dog surgery and used it by building a medical team to turn it into a modern innovative surgery that after 11 years took me from wheelchair to walking. Mm -hmm. To me, that's still a miracle. So, so I needed a second surgery, and I got it. It took me almost two years later. There's two adrenal glands. And that was a complicated recovery. 
in all this whole arc it took 14 years. During that time, I developed new uses for five existing prescription drugs. I developed a surgery that fixed me. We figured out what was wrong, and we sort of laid a roadmap for an innovative surgery and for looking at rare conditions that involve excessive epinephrine release but don't have any traditional tumors. So but what we need to do here at the Society for Participatory Medicine is look a little bit at how I was able to work with these doctors. Because that's why we're here, is to think about how patients can better participate in their care. So let's look at this. How did I meet the doctors? One of the things I did is I asked myself, how are doctors already being led by their subordinates? Well, they are. Researchers are led by postdocs and grad students. Attending physicians have residents and clinical fellows they work with. So that's what I did. I approached them with the energy of a resident or a grad student. That doesn't mean sort of bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. What it meant was I approached them in a non-emotional way. I delivered information to them impartially. And I established myself as a reliable conduit of information. That was the base. Before we could even begin, those things had to be true. The doctors had to see me in that way. The next thing, how did I get what mattered? There were three parts. I had to know what I wanted and ask for it. I had to explain the request, focusing on why it's within their purview to grant, should they choose, why they can do it if they want. And then I would ask for just one thing. So we'll look at these a little bit closer. So how did I build trust with the doctors? They had to know that I cared as much about the position I was asking them to be in as I wanted them to care about mine. There was no win for me that wasn't a win-win. So, so how do you do that? Well, you understand that doctors have a code and a fidelity to it. So this is what I wrote. Their role as a practicing physician is likely to be the most important, cherished part of their adult self-concept. Their idea of themselves as a doctor is central to who they are. There's a saying, once a Marine, always a Marine. Well, once a doctor, you're always a doctor. So how does that look in real life? Or at least not in real life, how can we envision this? There was a show that was turned into a movie, and it was called The Fugitive. And for four years, that was the, di that was the tension. Dr. Richard Kimball here on the left, or whichever side you see it as, and the cop chasing him. So his job was to catch the real killer, which meant his, his goals were to be invisible and find the killer. And every week he'd be doing his job as a day laborer, pitching bales of hay, and some guy gets stabbed with a pitchfork. Well, he had two choices. If he puts his own needs first, he stays invisible. If he saves the life of a person he's never met, he's gonna raise his profile and he'll be back on the run. That's what it looks like. Every week they could make a show about the fact the doctors choose to be healers. And he would choose to put the patient's need ahead of his. In the middle picture, that's him saving the life of the cop that spends all these years trying to send him to prison. So that's a little bit of what it looks like. But this idea of doctors as healers, they could fail me, and that wouldn't necessarily be damaged. Because everyone doctors see you're sick. If you help eight out of 10 patients, you've helped a lot of people. If you're in the NBA and you make eight out of 10 free throws, you're a pretty good free throw shooter. So as a rare disease patient, I could realize that I had to know what I wanted to help them help me. So then the task is, again, what do you do next? Every argument I made, from every surgery, every medication, they all boiled down to this sentence. Taking this action is consistent with your image of yourself as a good doctor because it helps me and it is consistent with your understanding of your privileges and responsibilities as a doctor. You can do this if you choose and still be a good doctor. And that's where the emotion part came in. The logos, knowing what I want, the ethos, understanding the physician's ethic. Here's the emotion. When a doctor spends 15 minutes with you and you've waited four months to see them, they're gonna leave the room feeling one of three ways. They, they hit a home run, I'm a healer. They hit a base hit. I can't do everything. I can't cure everyone, but I can almost always do something for them. Or, I can't help everyone. But that third one is deeply emotionally unsatisfying. Because you're sitting with them, they will help you even at their own expense, just like the doctor and the fugitive. They don't like that. So what I would do is I would ask for one hard thing. Because if I asked for three things, they'd give me the two easy one and leave me hanging on the one I really needed. I would put the entire emotional weight of the appointment on this one thing. And they got to decide, 
Are they a healer? Did they hit a home run today? Did they help me with this thing? Or did they leave me hanging? And that's how I work with the doctors. That's how, that's what I mean when I say, I had to know what I wanted. I had to explain to them that they could do this, that it is within their power to do this and be a good physician. And then I would put it all on one thing. Even if I needed five things, those would be emails or follow-up phone calls or something. But that's how I work with doctors.